Hi and welcome, my name's Richard and today we're going to go over a couple of the modifications that you need to make on your turbocharged R53 to make everything fit together. So since the last videos, the engine's installed, but what I want to run over is some of the things that you have to consider when installing one of these turbochargers in an R53 and all of the other items that are going to have to move. So the first thing you're going to have to consider is what you're going to do with your coolant and power steering tank. Originally, the coolant and the power steering tank lived at the back, just here, about centrally behind the uh, oil fill area. What we want to do is move the tanks away from this area. Now there's a lot of things and a lot of different ways that you can do this. I've seen certain companies take the power steering tank and locate it over into this location here, uh, right next to your brake boosters. Obviously in the US you're going to be doing that onto the other side of the car and then changing the pipe work to run it down to the bottom. Your coolant tank, there's a few different things people like to do. Some like to move the coolant tank over. That's kind of a uh, standard location. You can see that on the screen in the photo. And other people like to bring it to the front. Some people like to stick the Cooper header tank on, which is you've got room sort of around that you can find. But what you will realize is there's a lot of space constraints of fitting everything in. What I've decided to do is use a combined coolant and power steering tank that I've made up. Everything sits over there and you change your oil lines down, which you will have seen in one of my previous videos. And then the coolant tank is essentially welded and the bracket that's holding it is the original bracket with the power steering end lopped off. One of the fixing tabs lopped off and welded in a different location and then some rivnets added to the wiper arm support mechanism. This allows me then to, uh, to fix that. It keeps me a standard bracket should I want to do anything with it and it sits in the location just over there. So that's nice and simple, it bleeds lovely, it's the highest area in the engine base, so even with your turbo which has got quite high coolant lines, your header tank's still the highest and it does bleed well. Other things you're gonna to have to consider is all of your coolant routing. Now we discussed in some of the earlier videos how I'd done my turbo feed and return lines back down to the water pump and from the thermostat. No worries, you've seen that, that's in the photos, we've talked about how we did that. Next thing you're going to have to consider is how to get it to the radiator and what radiator to run. I see lots of people running all sorts of different radiators. My choice is actually a 40mm aluminium Cooper, uh, Cooper with air conditioning. There's a difference. If you have it without the air conditioning, it's basically a twin pass and both of your pipes are over here. That can cause you a bit of an issue when it comes to routing your, uh, your intercooler pipe work. There are other marks, you can go for a pro alloy where they basically give you a smaller radiator and then they put the intercooler in front of it and the pipework passes over the top. I've seen guys running MX-5, I've seen them running um, Polo twin pass radiators which are a lot smaller and doing stack by sack or side by side. My choice on here is we've got a 40 by 40 radiator aluminium across the front here because it's an air conditioning radiator you actually get some brackets on here so this bar runs across from on the original air conditioning brackets and down here I've got my oil cooler which runs down to a thermostat and goes to the side of the engine and on the front of the car we've got a plate and bar radiator or intercooler and that basically comes from the turbo round the pipe work down round into my intercooler cross path there's some really nice turbulators in this plate and bar. One of the advantages about a plate and bar is they're a good sturdy construction, but they also have good turbulators, so your heat rejection is quite good on this type of radiator. Coming out of there, it goes round, it goes up, and it goes into my inlet manifold. This is a uh, modified, but originally GRS made this item. It's running the three bar map sensor, which you can get from UMNO, and UMNIO, however you say it, uh, links down below. Standard throttle body. Previously, I've gone bigger on the throttle body. I've run a, a throttle body off a 335. I find them really difficult to control. They're really difficult to drive. And the reason for this is you don't have that lovely low down control on the butterfly valves. So this smaller little 1.6 engine starts getting a bit flooded with air. Maybe the right way to do it. And it's very hard to control it at low RPM. So I've gone back to the standard throttle body. Good unit, nice and easy to control. No worries, just stick with that. Over here, I've got my uh, blow-off valve installed and some of these components we've already gone over. Fan-wise, 
on the back here, it's running the stock fan. It is modified to go into my wiring loom and I'm no longer using the resistors or anything. All that rubbish is gone. I'm just using one speed back to my Vipec ECU or G4, or whatever ECU you want to use, it's all the same. In there you can control the characteristics that you want to deliver to this fan. Even if you want to go PWM, you can change and go that route. My route uses the standard relay inside the engine fuse box, comes back to the fan, it's basically bang on, bang off. But I've got control of what point does this and when, so I can choose to have this radiator coming on, for example, at zero RPM, if the temperature's over, or I could say, don't come on unless you're 2000 RPM and the car is over temperature. So you, you can change your parameters and you can pick quite a few different parameters to control your radiator fan. So, stock fan, great. One of the things I see, and it's on lots of R53s, whether they're turbocharged or supercharged, is people don't seem to understand the way that these fans work and they're making their cars more inefficient by replacing the radiator. On these radiators, one of the most important things is all of the front air needs to be captured and not bypassed around the radiator. So if you're using a fan that just goes straight onto the back of the radiator, great, the air is going to be pulled through the core. If you're going to be using, like I have, the plastic cowl, be it modified, with the standard radiator fan, what you'll notice all the way along the front here is I've got foam in here. Now this was originally fitted from BMW in most instances, but what a lot of people tend to do is remove the radiator, replace the radiator, and they leave the foam out. So consequently, when this fan starts pulling air through, you've got this great big void here where the air's going to pull it, where the fan will pull the air through. That's bad because you're no longer pulling through the core. So when you are putting a radiator in, whatever you're doing, make sure your fans are sealed all the way around because the last thing you want to be doing is pulling the air round the radiator, not through the radiator. The plastic cowling, you may notice it looks different to a normal Cooper S, it is, but it is a standard plastic uh, shroud, but basically all I've done is cut all the ribs off and cut the supports off and lowered it down. I just like the clean look that you get from that, I like being able to see straight into the engine from this angle. And for me that just works. One thing I like is this radiator isn't hard mounted over to these arms, and what you'll find is a lot of the aluminium radiators will crack down one side or the other and the reason for that is these two arms even though everything's braced up will move like that as you're going through corners the subframe and everything doesn't tie it together all that well so you've got these two arms constantly moving as you're driving around corners and and you'll find that this area here is doing a lot more work so keeping with the plastic cowling the way it was meant to be means that this has some degree of movement also you have the engine moving as you rev up and down so you want all of this to be able to float and move a little bit going hard mount either side it's just going to end up in disaster so when you're doing this and you're putting your radiator in you need to think this needs to move because this is going to move even if you've got solid mounts maybe not if you've got solid mounts but with all of the poly bushes this still moves and consequently this is attached to the radiator through pipes you've got to think everything needs to move otherwise you're going to break something and longevity is certainly something I would want to consider when developing the engine further. Pipe work to the radiator. Still got my aluminium thermostat that you saw in one of the earlier videos. And all I've got here is the silicon hose comes out, bends 90 degrees. Over this side here, I have got the original Cooper 90 degree with a bleed hose in it. That means I can put my screwdriver on and I can bleed. The pipe comes up and over the alternator. This is the highest point in the engine bay. Uh, sorry, it's not the highest point. This is the highest point of the coolant system above the radiator. The next highest point is my turbo followed by the coolant tank. And when you bleed a turbo system, you probably want to go with a vacuum bleed system. You'll always find that this wants to hold onto some air, so I always vacuum bleed when I'm doing the system. Unless you're crazy, you will have kept all of your electronics standard within the car. I'm crazy. All of my ECU, my fuse box, everything is within the cabin. I've removed the airbag to give me room for my fuse box. I don't need a passenger airbag. This is a car for me to drive. My fuse box is in there. My ECU is in there. You can see the photos on the screen. This is how I decided to install it. It's nice and simple. I can remove the front panel off my dashboard. There's my fuse box. I can take the centre clock out if I need to get to my ECU. The chances are I will never need to get to that ECU once it's in place. I've got ECU link out to the PC through a USB. Fine. 
that covers me for pretty much everything I want to do. But you're not going to sit there necessarily and build yourself on a whole wiring harness just so you can have a turbo. You might want to keep it simple. So what do you do with your ECU and your fuse box? From standard fit, as the picture on the screen, they're there and there. And we need to make sure that those locations are free and with a signed winder you still can, as you'll see in the photo, fit the ECU and the fuse box. But how? The fuse box, I've only got the front off it, is this system and that's great. Nice little simple fuse box with a cover on it. If you want to, just leave it as it is. That goes right up against the side of the engine bay, leaving you with about four or five inches still for your ECU. But you've got to think about how you're going to progress and get that ECU in there. The most common route is to take your existing airbox off your supercharged car. And what you do, at the bottom, it's held together with ribs all the way down here. Just run a saw through that, and that will separate your ECU box from your airbox. That means, once you've heat lined it as well, because there's going to be a whole lot of heat even if you are wrapping the turbo. This is only a simple tin because previously, on my previous build, I just kept it as simple as I could just to get it up and running. You can then take this and locate him just inside there. And just to prove the point that you can, the fuse box lid, if I put him over here, it's actually further over. There we go. I haven't got a lot of room, but I've probably got about an inch between the ECU box and the turbo. If you want to keep things simple, do this. If you want to make your life awkward, take the fuse box, take the ECU and shove it out of the engine bay. It looks a lot cleaner for it not being there, but are you going to go through all of that hassle? And it, it, it really is a lot of hassle making up a whole harness because a lot of the wires that come here aren't necessarily your engine harness. Some of it is, some of it's part of your main harness. So for me to do this, I've built a custom engine harness. I've then stripped back all of the harnessing that came to the front, took it back through the gland, cut it all to different lengths, rerouted it, and trimmed it all down to the lengths that it needs to be. If you want to go for the hassle, go for it. If you want this look, nice clean look, get rid of it. It makes the engine bay look so much better for it. But if you want simplicity, leave it alone. You can make all of the changes without having to do all of these difficult wiring looms. It also means that you could use the standard engine wiring harness, and that's gotta be beneficial. If you're not good with electronics and it scares you or electrics, leave that alone. Thank you for watching my video. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you found it useful, hit the like button. If you wanna see more of this content, hit the subscribe button. Otherwise, Thank you for watching, take it easy.